So um, just a little FYI before we get going, I do have uh, on, um, on Piazza, I put up a, a little uh, thing for those of you who are interested in doing a group project, right? So the default idea is that, you know, if you don't come talk to us, we're going to assume that you're doing a one person project. And a one person project is going to be a fairly small subset of the work in that Caruana paper that we gave you guys the information on a few weeks ago. All right. So if you're doing a one person project, you're going to do a small subset of that Caruana work. I'm going to roughly expect that if you take you know, however many data sets it was. Did we say four data sets? I can't even remember now. Uh, you take those however many data sets we told you out of the same list of data sets that Caruana got uh, their stuff from, which is the UC Irvine machine learning library data set stuff. Okay. And you'll do the five trials and the you know three different algorithms and it will take you a couple tens of hours of computation time and a couple ten hours maybe of writing a report or less if you're good at it okay and bada bing bada bang you're done it's going to be roughly an a minus and yay OK, uh, if you want to do something a little different, you certainly can add on the extra credit stuff we laid out in the project description. Um, and if you want to do something very different, I suggest you go for a group project that you get together a bunch of friends or enemies or whatever, and you uh, in groups of no more than four, write a proposal about what you want to do and give it to me. And that proposal has to be in by uh, February 26th, which I did not write, or February 28th, sorry, the end of February. All right. Send me a proposal before then, all right? Uh, preferably, as I said on Piazza, I would like you to submit the proposal to us on Piazza, okay? Um, and the proposal doesn't have to be anything fancy. It can be a list of bullet points, okay? But I wanna know what your data sets are gonna use are, what the goal of the kind of pr group project is, because it doesn't have to be a replication of Caruana, okay? I'm okay with you going crazy and doing something totally new, as long as it has aspects to it that include hyperparameter tuning, finding the right sets for the dials for the whatever algorithm, and comparing different algorithms performance, okay? So if you want to do some other weird project that you found on Kaggle or uh, a, a, you know, hackathon challenge or whatever, I'm down if it's got the right structure to it. And for us to know if it has the right structure to it, you have to write us a relatively simple and easy proposal. If you don't send a proposal in, we assume you're doing a single person project. Okay. Any questions on that stuff? Uh, I saw that Ron asked, did the data set have to be used uh, the same? Does the data set have to be used in the paper? No, I'm okay with you going outside it. But if you if you get an outside data set from outside of a well clean source like the UC Irvine library, you're going to have to do cleaning, right? And that's a lot of extra work potentially, depending upon the data set. So, um, I I think that this covers all the the things, right? Let's get into fixing our understanding of kernel SVM, right? The intuition we start with is that we're going to replace our inputs 
right? Whatever, whatever things we had going on in the inputs, we're gonna replace them with similarity measures. How similar our input is, a given input is, to a set of landmarks, okay? So what are those landmarks? Well, in fact, they're going to be the data set itself, okay, the training data. So when we go and we try to classify, you know, this new training point X in relationship to the Sorry. existing landmarks, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, your screen is showing like many windows. It's not actually showing the slides, like, like not full screen. Mm. It's like cropped, wow. so yeah. All right. Let's let's see how to fix that. Thank you. Is it still showing it cropped or is it showing the slides? No, it's good. No, only the slides. All right. Thank Great. you. Okay. So Right here we are with the uh, the training set is determining these landmarks. They're just the training data points. And if we're going to make some prediction about whether or not this data point lies in a positive class or a negative class, well, we're just going to have this transformation, this similarity measure applied to every single one of these training points. Okay, so now our our parameters, our decision our decision function is going to be parameterized on the feature data set, the, the features of the data set, the feature transformations, and we just make up some W's here. Okay, and critically, I want to call your attention to a couple of things. Right. So what the W's are is, of course, as always, our parameters that the SVM is learning, okay? So let's just leave how it learns it aside for a second, but we have some learned parameters. We know that we have some hyperparameters, right? We have the hyperparameter C, which controls the margin, right? And therefore the bias variance trade-off, right? When we have a high C, then we're going to care a lot about misclassifications. We're going to have a hard margin. We're going to have, in those cases, as we've talked about in the past, a high bias situation. We're going to fit things really hard. So we're going to fit, you know, the line is going to be exactly where the, these boundaries lie. Okay which as we said before, sorry, I went off the thing there, is going to be the union of these circles where the circles here are corresponding to the similarity measure, right? Now that, that similarity measure is parameterized by the sigma, right? And when that sigma gets bigger, then our positive area is going to get bigger too, right? And when that sigma is small, then those circles shrink down and they become small, okay? So sigma of one would get you something like this, and a sigma of 10 would get you something like this. So in this case, points that lie only strictly inside here right, are going to be positive and things outside are going to be negative class. Okay, so this, this gives you the idea of everything about using a radial basis SVM kernel, okay? We have one parameter that controls how hard the decision is, and if that if that guy is, you know, if C is a small value, then we're going to care more about getting a bigger margin, right? And so we're going to be more biased and less, uh, less uh, variance. 
and we're going to be more accepting of confusing data points, right? So, um, you know, when we have non-separability, like we talked about in the past, and we also have the sigma, and the sigma controls how much, how far away from a given landmark the influence can go to, right? So if we have big sigmas, then, you know, we have a big area that this landmark is going to say is probably in the positive class, okay? And when they have small sigmas, we have a small area that that landmark can influence. So in this way, I want you to again remind yourselves of how k-nearest neighbors works, right? So in some sense, the radial basis function version of SVM has a strong flavor of a weighted version of k-nearest neighbors, where the, it, the, it's not just how many neighbors we've got, right? So k-nearest neighbors would use, say, these three nearest neighbors and take the maximum vote. But there's also this distance involved, right? And so if the data point is instead over here, then landmark one is going to have much more influence in determining the classification of that point. And if it's over here, then landmark three is going to have much more influence, okay? Whereas for a k-nearest neighbors, that's always, that's always going to have the same answer, right? All three of these locations that have been drawn for the new data point, right? They all would have the same answer in k-nearest neighbors land, but they could potentially have very different answers in radial basis function SVM land. Okay, I want to stop for a second and make sure everybody's caught up on the ideas behind all this. Isaac asks, is there such a thing as weighted k-nearest neighbors? There is, yes. And uh, scikit-learn will implement that for you if you're interested in it. So now, the big deal with SVM where weighted k-nearest neighbors cannot go is the computation aspect, okay? So while a weighted k-nearest neighbors can probably do roughly the same thing as a radial basis function uh, version of SVM, the, the computation is totally different. And we talked a little bit at the end about this idea that what we're gonna do is we're going to look at the ways in which kernels can give us the effect of a high dimensional expansion, right? So taking something that's a quadratic problem and expanding it into a high dimensional space, right? Where we blow up the problem so that those, those functions all lie like this, and we can put a dividing line between them by blowing it up into a high dimensional space. We're familiar with the idea, like with a polynomial regression, where we take the X and we expand it up to an X to the M power, right? But we know that if we do that with high dimensional data already, and we expand it into that high dimension to, this, to the power of M, we're asking for trouble, right? If you start off with 100 dimensional data, and you want to make a ninth order polynomial out of 100 dimensional data, then you're going to get 100 to the ninth power variables, which is insanity, right? You, there's going to be computationally costly. So the kernel trick in SVM is a unique way to fix this problem. We get the effect of making our decisions in high dimensional data land but we do it in low dimensional space. And how does that work? Well, we need this magical kernel thing. Some function, which is notated phi here. 
And for something to be a kernel, it obviously has to have some mathematical properties. I'm going to not go through those, but for those of you that are interested in it, it's something that satisfies Mercer's theorem, okay? So roughly speaking, it's got to have a certain set of properties and it, whatever satisfies those sets of properties is a kernel. Now, the, the key idea is that the kernel distance, that similarity measure, right? Our radial basis function, which, you know, had this Gaussian that spreads out from our landmark, okay? What we're looking at is for some new data point, right? What is, what is this, ah, sorry. That was not what I wanted to do. Okay, it's not gonna let me fix that, but whatever. Okay, what is the similarity between the green and the purple, right? That's the Gaussian function is going to determine what that similarity is. So our kernel is always going to produce a similarity. And that similarity is going to be done as an inner product, as a dot product, okay? That is the kernel trick. If what we do is we can make, we can write this kernel as a dot product, then what we get out of a dot product is how many dimensions? If we have an n-dimensional vector, dot product, an n-dimensional vector, how many dimensions come out of a dot product? Would it help if I wrote it like this? One. Okay. So every similarity comparison, right? And you can think of it objectively right here in front of you. How similar the purple and the green are is a one is a one-dimensional number. It's a scalar, right? It's a number between, say, zero and one, right? Where something that's far, far away over here is say effectively similarity zero. And something that's way over here is effectively similarity one, right? So we have one scalar number for every single landmark. We go from the fact that while this, this kernel may operate in a very high dimensional space, it could operate in that ninth order polynomial space. We can design kernels that do that. But the dot product is the similarity of any given data point to a landmark. And that is just one dimensional, right? And we're going to operate on those. We're going to operate on the similarities, right? So we showed you the last time about how the way we're used to thinking about SVMs, right? This loss function that we have has a dual form. And that dual form is the way in which the computation happens. You don't have to know how that works. It's too much detail. But the intuition is that the weights are really just a linear sum of your data with a little alpha factor in there. And that alpha factor is zero for everything that's not actually a support vector. And for things that are support vectors, the definition of it being a support vector is where the alpha gets assigned to be non-zero, okay? So that formulation, this dual formulation using the Lagrangian, okay, is how we fix the current, is how we do the kernel trick. So we have this kernel defined on two data points, X and Z, right? Think of Z as the landmark in the previous thing. I should have not borrowed this person's slides without changing the notation, right? So we have this dot product. We get this one dimensional answer out of that, which means that the dimensionality of our feature vector is only the number of data samples, okay? So if our number of data samples is ridiculously huge, obviously we could still have a problem. 
Okay. So, but in general, you're going to often find that a ninth order polynomial on a hundred dimensional data is going to be a number much, much bigger than the number of data points you have. Okay. So generally speaking, depending upon the data set, a representation like this, where we turn all the training points into features and we look at the similarity of the data to every training point, is going to give us a lower dimensional data representation than actually blowing up the 100 dimensions into the 100th to the ninth power. OK? And as we said, we're going to use that dual formulation. And now the whole thing is just operating instead of on, originally this was just the feature vector and the inputs x. Now it operates instead on the kernel of an x input with all the previous data points. OK? Yeah, voila. All right. Um, so here is just to give you just a little bit more of a taste. This is not something that we're going to be testing or doing uh, a homework on. I just want to help you really grasp this concept, OK? So if we're going to do the polynomial trick, right, where if you remember the data problem that we did, right, we had something that was not separable linearly in two dimensions. And we can blow that up into my very poor three-dimensional version of this, right? Where we do a we do a quadratic like that, right? Do the expansion, bring it up into a third dimension. So we can draw that plane to separate them. Okay. So we're actually going to do that. What would that kernel look like? Well, to do a polynomial, right, you need to do for a second order polynomial like this, we need to do every possible pair of input variables. So x1 and x2 in this original space, right? OK, we need to do every possible version of x1, x2, x1 and x2, or x1 squared and x2 squared, et cetera, et cetera. So you can generally write that like this. OK. And so we just compute using that inner product between Okay, where phi is once again just this. Okay. One plus x transpose times the landmark squared, right? Because you can foil that out and see that you've got a generic, you know, second order polynomial here. Okay. So we compute on those one-dimensional answers, OK? <clears throat> so this is why people use SVMs. We've talked about this already. They're robust in the sense that only the support vectors matter, right? So if we have stuff corrupted by noise, right, we want to find the margin, OK? Only these close data points matter. So any corrupted by noise that's happening out here doesn't affect the answer, right? These data points can move around and not change where the margins are, OK? So because they're only determined by the support vectors, they're less, less affected by random noise in their answers. We also know that we have an explicit bias variance trade-off because the margin size here 
is going to be a function of the weights, right? The weights get smaller, the margin gets bigger. And we know that we can control the weights because we have the C term, right? And a large C term means we get a lot harder margins, smaller, harder margins. And a small C term means that we get bigger margins. Okay. So it's very explicit how we do that trade off. We've got a relatively small number of hyperparameters in the SVM. It's basically the C number, the sigma, right? Remember the sigma too. So if we do kernel SVM instead of linear SVM, we have in most of those kernels, we will have a parameter or two, okay? For a radial basis function, the next hyperparameter we will get that we care about is the sigma, okay? The sigma spreads the influence of each landmark. Big sigmas lead to more soft solutions. Think about like the high numbers of k-nearest neighbors. And we had like 14 nearest neighbors, right? And those, those margins got very soft and smooth and they averaged over a large number of training dots, okay? So um, that is going to have a, a bias variance trade-off, but not everything is a radial basis function, right? We have the polynomial kernel and in the polynomial kernel, our parameter is going to be um, m, the order of the polynomial, okay? And there are more possible things, but we're not gonna go into those. So SVMs, they've got generally just two or so hyperparameters, which is better than something like, I don't know, a deep learning network, which has a trillion parameters, okay? So, but there's something going on. Sorry. There's something going on in the, uh, in the in, in, chat that I missed. Yeah. Uh, uh, Isaac, I think, has a question about um, uh, how do we decide how many non zero alphas in the number of uh, SVs we have? Okay. So the support vectors are determined by the dual formulation operating on the data. And to get into understanding that, I have to get into the math, which I don't want to do. But minimally, in the sense of a linear SVM, right? You know that you you can determine that by the fact that you need two support vectors to make a line. So you're always going to see like two support vectors on one side, and this is probably the confusion, right? that will determine if I was drawing better the line and then the third one over on this side, right? So if that, if that was the, the confusion point, that was my bad drawing, but yeah. I think, oh, sorry, could I ask a question? Um, Go ahead, I think Isaac. I remember um, when you were giving the demonstration of the Jupyter Notebook um, on Wednesday, mm -hmm. you were showing how you need at least three support vectors to define the line, like that's the minimum geometrically required to define the line. No, you need two for the line and the third one to define the other margin, right? Oh, I see. Okay. But, and then right. I was confused so gonna... when, you, when, you, when you moved on to the RBF kernel, why it needed eight. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I don't know that I have an intuition for you on how many is needed for a given RBF. Uh, I haven't gone through it myself to understand that math. Um, but you can easily think of the fact that in a more complex polynomial, right, you're going to need, for a line, you need two. To define a, a higher order polynomial, a th third order thing, you'll need at least, uh, you'll need at least three, yeah, and so on and so forth. So the more complex the kernel, I think the, it's a good intuition that you will need more support vectors. But I, I, I'm not getting the right math in my head to tell you off the, top, off the top of my head how the radial basis function selects the right number. Okay, gotcha. And then another clarification, if I might. Um, I was confused mm -hmm. why, when you, like, for example, you gave white, when you needed, when you 
for the polynomial, if you if you scaled up to nine dimensions, why it took why you had to take your input dimensions and then exponentiate them to the ninth versus just multiplying the number of dimensions you have to the ninth. Because I thought that like when we were doing the the polynomial regression, when you had one variable, then you had nine variables when you when you Correct. break the ninth level. So you're just multiplying it by nine. Well, what if what if you have two variables, right? X1 and X2. Okay, so instead of having just x1, which was what we had been doing, you have x1, x2. So your, your uh, second order polynomial is going to be one plus x1. Oh gosh, let me do this right. One plus x1 plus x2 plus x1, x2 plus x1 squared plus x2 squared, right? So now you don't just, in the x1 case, you just added one more, right? But for the two variables case, you've got a heck of a lot more. So it's, you've squared the number of variables or uh, doubled the number of variables that you started with, right? Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, so I'm doubting myself now, maybe it's not to the ninth power to have a ninth order polynomial, but I think that's true. And I'm just, I'm, uh, what do we got here? Somebody want to like chime in be, with intuition? It seems like it might be like the number of dimensions or like it might be the number of original dimensions choose two plus choose three plus choose four all the way up to choose the number of the order of your polynomial that you're choosing. Yeah. Because like an x cubed, you would have to do this, right? Um, and then you would have to have an x1, x3, and an x1, uh, x2, and then an x3 squared. I think you'll have to do a so, combination or a combination because this, like, yeah, I, it is know. starting. It is starting to sound like that, and not to a polynomial. Yeah. So, okay. My bad on just waving my hands and stating something incorrect, but the general principle remains, which is that to do a higher order expansion, when you have not three, but 300 variables can be super costly, right? And, and you can do kernel, like you can, you can explicitly transform up to the higher dimension and use any algorithm you want. Okay. You can do higher, you can do a kernelized version of logistic regression. You can do a kernelized perceptron. And in fact, that's something called a radial basis network. Okay. Right. You can do the explicit transformation up to a high dimensionality to solve the XOR problem, right? By transforming radial basis functions on the data and then applying a perceptron and you'll solve the XOR, no problem with the perceptron. The kernel trick is applicable to the unique math of the support vector machine. The unique math of the support vector machine in this dual setup allows you to use the similarity metric. And as long as you've got a small enough number of data points that it's more computationally efficient than actually expanding to the high dimensional space, then something like a kernelized support vector machine is an excellent choice. Do people just not include any cross factors and just that way just nine times the original number of dimensions? So it's just all the way up to the order? I, like I said, I right now, because I'm in lecturing mode, I, I find myself blocked to, fi to fix the thinking. So uh, maybe if you want to work it out, and we can you can give us some notes on Piazza, or maybe I will uh, when I'm able to sit down and have a drink after this. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. All right. So I really want to get on because we actually have a completely different topic to cover. So before I do that, do people feel like at least the intuition behind kernelized SVM is something that they mostly have a grip on? Or is there like another, another thing we want to hit here?
Can I just ask a quick question about the C parameter? Yeah, go ahead, Ron. The way that I'm trying to think about it, I'm confused as to how raise it. You said that raising the value of C um, creates a smaller margin. Is that correct? Yes. So the reason uh, wait. The um, yeah, the reason raising. Okay. Yes, that's right. If you if you were if we're talking about the loss function, right, and the C parameter mm -hmm. is influencing kind of like the the how much the the regularization like of W like matters, essentially, then I would think that a larger C would cause the loss function to want to shrink W more, uh, and then therefore W being shrunk more would mean a larger margin for the higher C. Although I might be completely thinking of how C works in this case wrong. Um, yeah. So so. This is oh gotcha gotcha that makes more sense right and the C is on this term this is the misclassification term right so here's the hinge loss right so so that is the the C is on the misclassification term yes thank you Isaac <laughs> true that um, uh, yeah so. So the, the C getting big means we care more about misclassification, right? So for the overlapping case, so we've got a few random excursions here, right? So um, in a case like this, actually, we're screwed. We can't actually be perfect in our misclassification error, right? right? But it's going to do something it's going to do something like this, right? It's going to draw a very hard margin with a very small hard margin right between, you know, the two close together points. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what it's going to do. Okay. All right. So hard C means it's going to try to minimize the number of misclassifications very strongly, mm -hmm. but a small C may end up drawing the margins instead like this. I think that I was mostly okay. confused about where C was in the in the error term. I see now that it doesn't relate to the, the W vector in the way that I thought yeah. it did. Yeah. Yeah. And so an, another point of confusion is that when we talked about regression, we were always doing the the mean squared error term plus lambda. Right. So C is exactly the opposite. Right, C is one over lambda. C is putting this thing over here and getting it off there. Right. Okay. Yeah. So different algorithms have different conventions based upon history, <laughs> right? But they have equivalent things. Thank you. Okay. So this brand new topic is how we're going to find the right model, OK? So we've already talked about splitting up data, right? We talked about using k-folds cross-validation or a train test split or various other ways to estimate the generalization error, okay? We were doing this with it. We were saying we can split up the data so that we can figure out how likely we are to see a given level of performance if we had brand new data that you know, we weren't trained on, okay? But we can use the same techniques, but in a slightly different way, of course, to do model selection, to find for things like, you know, what is the best value of C or sigma to use for a given data set with our SVM. So that's the finding the best set of hyperparameters. Okay. Or, you know, if we're doing not kernelized SVM, but some other algorithm where we might benefit from, say, a higher order transformation of the features, right? How can we select the best set of features? Okay. Or, like in the case of our project, 
where what we're often or what we're actually concerned with is what's the best algorithm to use for a given problem. Okay. That these all are just different subsets of something that most people will refer to as model selection. You will see something like feature selection, okay? And it is, it is a little unique. And there are some tricks in feature selection that you don't see in the others, okay? But um, I'm not gonna necessarily have time to cover that. Maybe I will in like one of the last classes. Uh, but just in general, what we're gonna say now goes for this whole world of model selection. Um, there is a last way in which we can use cross-validation and its cousins, which is to figure out if there's a true winner among any one of these things we're gonna try here, okay? So I wanna make ultra clear that the Caruana paper is concerned with this stuff, okay? That's what's going on in the Caruana paper. This is something a little bit different. And um, Caruana does the model selection and then applies some statistics on top of it. But there is a way to design the splitting up of the data to best figure out the, whether there's a winner in all our different algorithms we're testing. And that's something a little different, OK? So we're not going to go as far as this today, but I'm going to try to introduce you to all the things that are useful for understanding our final project. OK, so I think we already kind of have a grasp on what is a hyperparameter, right? It's a setting for the algorithm, like how many neighbors, what's the C value, et cetera. OK, and uh, when you look in scikit-learn or any other library which implements your algorithms, because in general, to be honest, you're not going to be coding up your algorithms from scratch the way we've had you doing, right? Having you do that for logistic regression is a useful exercise so you can understand some of the details that go into these things, help you understand the problems that are faced by creating a solver and so on. But realistically, to do this well, it requires quite a high level of execution. So I would almost never recommend that you roll your algorithm from scratch the same way I would never recommend that you um, like code up how to find eigenvalues from a matrix or you know calculate square roots yourself. You're just going to use the library, right? But if you want to see what hyperparameters you have, I, 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 what microparameters you have, right? You can go and look in the library and see that in the case of SVM, we have the, the regularization parameter, the kernel parameter. If using a polynomial function, the degree, if using a RBF, then you have the, that's the sigma, gamma is the sigma in what I've been noting it, right? Okay. So how are we gonna do this? How are we going to choose the best things, right? This simple six-step plan is the generic form, all right? We have all of our data, step one, okay? We have our training data. It consists of the usual thing, right? The, the notation we've been using has been, right, pairs of inputs and labels. Okay, so um, that's all our data. We need to split it up into stuff we use for training, stuff we use for validating, and stuff we use for testing. Okay, I guess I could actually make my colors match here, but whatever. Okay, so in the simple three-way holdout, right? This is an extension of, we've already talked about a test set as separate from a training set. To find parameters, we need a training set, a validation set, and a test set. So we know what the training set is. 
It's what we'd use to train the model. So if we have one parameter, like k nearest neighbors, we have k. All right, we have to decide what are our sets of k's. So let's try every k. Oops, let me use the correct color for consistency. Let's try every k in this list. Okay. And so let's say that that goes up to whatever um, 13. So that means there's, um, is that, I, my math is terrible right now. Is that seven? Um, no, it's six, right? So, so that means there's six models. So we're going to train, I'm going to, Note that, that there are six models here. This is my bad example, right? So we're going to train one, two, three, four, five, six models of the different K nearest neighbors. Okay. So then we're going to compare those six models by using the validation set, right? So we have each model that is trained on the same training data, run through the validation data, and we get a performance level for each of the six models. So the best model is the one that has the best performance on the validation data. Okay. Step four, we retrain. Okay. Now we can use this blue stuff to train up on. Okay, we don't want to throw it away and waste it. So we take the best hyperparameter values and we retrain our best model on the combination of the training data and the validation data. Okay, step five is we need to get an estimate of the generalization performance. Generalization performance is done with that test data. So we have the trained algorithm, once again, with the new expanded training set, and we run it through the test data, get a performance level, okay? And that tells us, you know, what we expect as generalization error. The final step is kind of optional, six. If you're going to put this into production, maybe this is what you would do. You would say, okay, I know how good I expected you now. So let me just train it on all of the data, training, test, and validation de data together before I throw it out into the world to do its job. Because, you know, more data is always better. Okay. So six is an optional step. Does this make sense to everybody? Because if this doesn't make sense, we need to make sure you're on board. This was boring compared to SVMs, huh? Not, not as big of a mental workout. Okay, great. Okay, this is the train test validation three-way holdout method which you use when you have enormous amounts of data. But usually we don't have enormous amounts of data. Usually we don't have a whole internet, a whole YouTube full of cat videos to train on, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to need to be more efficient with our data than just parceling it out into train test validate. We're gonna need to do something with k-folds, okay? So, um, so yeah, okay, whatever. This slide is to remind us of all the things, right? We need to make sure we don't leak information from training set into either the validation or the test set, right? So um, important is that every single bit of selection we do, we have to do it on the validation set, right? Um, so we know that if we don't have enough data, we're gonna have a trade-off between putting stuff in training set, validation set, and test set. So 
we're going to run on to k folds cross validation. Right? Works exactly the same. So we have our training set. We don't have a separate validation set anymore. We get to use all the data in the training side. Okay? So we still need potentially a test set, okay? So if I wanna note this the way we had been doing it, um, we have um, all the data is gonna get split up into a separate test set for generalization purposes. That's still true, but all of this stuff here goes into the cross-validation, right? And what the cross-validation does is it reuses the training data with different training folds, right? So we, we train on, uh, you know, four-fifths of the data here, and then we only test on this holdout fifth. And then we move that holdout fifth to a different part of the data, and so on and so forth, right? We get five different performance metrics, and we just take the mean over those as our indicator of performance, OK? So same procedure applies. We have our 6K values that we're going to use, OK? So we're going to try all 6K values. We're going to create six different models. The models are going to be trained on this cross-validation, this five-fold cross-validator. We're going to get six different performance levels out of that. One of them will be the best. So we're going to take the best model. We're going to go ahead and fit it on all of the data and come out with our best model all trained up. And that best model is going to go through the test data and get the, um, the estimate of generalization from the test data. And then if we're gonna put it into production, we'll train it on the whole data set one more time before we send it out to Google to use, okay? Everybody's still with me. All right. So as we mentioned the last time we talked about K-folds cross-validation, changing the K kind of changes the problem a little bit, right? So in the extreme case where K is equal to the number of data samples you have, this is something called leave one out cross-validation. And leave one out cross-validation, or this abbreviation you'll see for it, is super unbiased. It means that every single time you train, you train on all the data except one data point. So you're only ever classifying one data point. And every single fold is either a yes, it's perfect classification, or no, it's perfect misclassification. So you can see that fold to fold, the variability is high, right? And therefore, the estimation is extremely unbiased. But it can also be the case that in some circumstances, leave one out cross validation, the variabilities can be so high, it swamps your answer, right? that you, the variability is so high, you don't actually get a good estimate of the real mean, okay? So in general, modern practice tends to suggest, even though leave one out cross-validation is unbiased, that you don't go that far, that you don't go to a, a K as big as your number of data samples. And besides, it's computationally very expensive to do that, okay? So most actual machine learning is done on Ks in that neighborhood of five or 10 or maybe 15. And oftentimes there's special extra tricks that people recommend you do to get 
the most power out of the least computations, okay? But let's be honest, it's kind of arguing over hair on the barbershop floor, very, very fine details that may not matter except in very particular circumstances. That's why a lot of people will just do five-fold cross-validation and be done with it, okay? And if you are getting into the theoretical end of stuff, then you should start to worry about this stuff. But if you're just trying to get something done, just do a five-fold cross-validation. <laughs> okay. So our project will default to this. So again, what's going to happen? We're going to have our training data and our um, test data during the project. We're going to do five-fold during the project. You're going to do that a gazillion times. Like, uh, like the project definition told you, you're probably going to be training hundreds of models. Right? And at the end, once you pick that, you pick the best one. And then you'll get a generalization error. Estimate out of that. Okay? So, I have to stop here because it's well past time as usual. Um, there are higher order things that we can educate you about, but you don't have to worry about unless you're really sharking for the extra credit in the project, okay? Um, the one thing I do wanna get done before we stop is how can we find those parameters, right? So. How do, how do we pick, you know, with K, with K nearest neighbors, it's easy. We're just going to try these K values, right? But what if you have C and sigma, okay? How can we search for the best possible combination of C and sigma? Well, one way is to do it on a grid, okay? You regularly space things out. Those could be a linear grid or this axis could be logarithmic. Like we, we try C values of 10, 100, and 1,000, okay? It may be, it, you would have to decide what's appropriate for your needs, okay? So the grid is an easy, simple way. Uh, it can be run completely in parallel. That's always good. So if you have, you know, these nine dots here, and you start up nine CPUs, each one of them is doing the problem with a different parameter set, stuff can be done quickly, okay? Uh, it is also the case that you might want to consider a randomized search rather than a regular search. There are particular cases where especially when you are trying to sample a large dimensional data set, like three or four or five hyperparameters, it might be more advantageous to you computationally to do a randomized layout instead of a grid layout. So if any of you have that problem, we should talk about that more. But for now, I'm going to stop. <laughs> so I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, the rest of you should get the heck out of Dodge. It's Friday. So. <laughs> um, I'm just kind of curious because it seems like most of the stuff we've been kind of working towards is for binary classification tasks, like, mm -hmm. you know, true case, not true case. And are we going to do anything that's outside of that? Or Yes, we will. Okay. Um, so, uh, so this is this is something that uh, I actually wanted to address with logistic regression, but I didn't find the way to cram it in. Uh, I will be actually I was going to do this with a demo video since I know there's some demo video stuff in there, um, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. So I will make sure that you guys get a chance to look at multinomial and one versus rest and one v one 
ways to deal with multiple classifications. So yes, Chase, thank you for bringing that up. I do That's intend to do it. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, Sadid is asking for a demo on Lagrange multipliers. No, sir. Not only is that well beyond the topic of this class, uh, I don't trust myself. I would have to spend some serious time studying up to make sure I didn't mess that up. So uh, for those that are interested, uh, I remember seeing, God, what's his name? Uh, Winston at MIT has a set of YouTube videos that you could go look at that in his version of the SVM thing, he does, he did, I remember thinking he did a really good job about looking at the dual formulation in a simple and direct way. So uh, I can find that and stick that uh, somewhere for people to see the, the link. What is, you can the, what is the practical difference between the loss functions for like a, a normal SVM linear kernel, uh, like normal distance measures, as opposed to like a, um, like a kernelized uh, version of SVM? Is it literally just the application of the kernel on the like x vector is that literally the only change in the in the loss yes. so it's the same exact same loss optimization process and that whole deal okay yeah all you do is you transform so in the linear svm case you operate on the x's right in the kernelized version you operate you effectively operate on the feature transformed version mm -hmm. but you do that by actually operating on the similarity metric instead right Okay. And I saw before the, um, the, the values of the, the hyperparameters you choose for the grid don't have to be linearly spaced. Correct. So there's here, there's the grid layout. They could be evenly spaced or they could be random. Key to that is uniformly random. Okay. Right. You don't want to concentrate on one part of the search space. You want to evenly cover the search space. But the, the intuition about why random search is good for high dimensionality is, is high dimensionality, right? So we, we already covered the curse of dimensionality, right? So if you have three or four or five parameters, your number of data points you need to tile the space closely at the same density is going to grow to the dth power. So, you know, that's, that's no good. So if you have a four hyperparameters, you're gonna need to get the same density. You're gonna need to do the same that, you know, this, if this was nine, you're gonna need to do nine to the fourth power, okay? So nobody wants that. Um, a randomized layout can get you um, a, relatively better coverage in the high dimensions for slightly less numbers of data points, okay? So that's the key. And um, you still have to have, oh my God, huge numbers of data points, but it's ever so slightly less, oh my God, huge number to get a good estimate of the, of the parameter space. I see, thank you. In could you do like a logarithmic scaling for the, the regular grid layout? Of course, both of them, random and grid. You know, so, so parameters like C often benefit from a logarithmic progression, okay? Like the difference between a C of one and a C of three is probably very small, but the difference between a C of one and a C of a hundred is generally significant, okay? So uh, parameters like k nearest neighbors k, it's usually more like a linear progression. Like a logarithmic progression of k is going to be often quite ridiculous. Okay, I see. Thank you. Mm Now, is it uh, Friday happy hour yet? Okay, 
If there's no further questions, I declare it happy hour. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, uh, rem good. Reminder that homework is due, although I've said this much too late. So, you know, um, have fun and talk with you all next week. Okay, thank you, bye. Bye. Hi, Professor. Hey, Abdullah, how are things?